predestination and free will, let's open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thanks for the time we get to spend together and ask that you would bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so you have to do me a favor today. We're going to try to do Whitfield and Wesley and get to the end. I have to be done with Whitfield and Wesley by quarter after. Okay? So no matter where we are, somebody has to stand up and go, it's quarter after. You need to be done with Whitfield and Wesley. And, uh, and that's going to be a really hard thing to do. Uh, I think in the end, what I, uh, what I realized from doing all the, the reading and the uh, evaluating of these guys and trying to understand where they're coming from, because you realize in this class, I'm not necessarily trying to tell you why they believe what they believe is wrong. I'm trying to tell you how they could come up with these beliefs and actually believe it because I think that's more important to try to understand than to try to refute everybody, which is our typical approach to, uh, to Bible study. And so um, uh, when we talk about Whitfield and Wesley, we're now in round four of, of this as we walk through history. And uh, for, you know, for us, for uh, how many of y'all have ever heard of Whitfield before we even talked about it before this class? It's only about a third of you, and that makes a lot of sense. You know, the historians would say that that uh, that uh, Whitfield was probably the most famous American in the history of colonial America that nobody remembers today. <laughs> right? Now he, he, he he's going to be our Calvinist in this uh, debate. Uh, and Wesley is going to be our Arminian in this debate. So a little bit of, uh, of quick history. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this chart. Uh, I gave you this as, as in your handouts. It's on the back side, so if you want to spend a little time. But for me, it's always good to get a little background of the, of the history. When you think of guys like Wesley and Whitfield, what you should think of is the first great awakening. How many of y'all have heard that term from a history perspective? Okay, so the first great awakening is happening in this time frame, in the uh, you know the the just before the mid mid part of the 1700s, and uh, the second great awakening happens over at this end. But it is Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, and John Wesley who are given the credit for the first great awakening, and it, and the Great Awakening happened because here were three guys that really wanted to push the idea that you have to believe in Jesus Christ if you want eternal life. They were going way back to the basics. A lot of times in history, if you go to your history books in school, you spend a lot of time on the, uh, the, col you know, the establishment of the colonies, right? And then you kind of jump to the Revolutionary War. And everybody misses this time frame in the 1700s, the early 1700s, because the Revolutionary War doesn't happen until, you know, 1776 and in that time frame, right? And so you got that this part of the American colonies is all British and really dedicated British. It's, it's a good thing. That dissension doesn't start happening until the, you know, 20 years or so prior to the, uh, um, uh, to the, Revolutionary War. However, many historians would say that the mindset and the thought process of the First Great Awakening is what allowed the independence of the American colonists at the time to push themselves towards independence. And so there's some really good things to study here. I would. Uh, I also came to the conclusion that I really like this American history stuff more than I ever did when I was having to do it in school. <laughs> and so, if you're interested, we could do a uh, a class just on the rise of American Protestant denominations within America over the the history of America, because we have so many of them, and most of them come out of some of these debates and some of these movements and just the mindset of America. Well, at this time, early 1700s, most uh, historians would indica indicate that, uh, that the number of people in America that actually attend church on a regular basis is way less than 20%. It's, it is not a Christian uh, country at this point. Now, a lot of the initial colonists that came over to America came over for religious freedom. But by this time, 
most people coming over to America are coming over for money. They're coming over for liberty. They're coming over for opportunity in this new world that, that anything goes to some extent. And so you, uh, you have the very last, and this is important, the very last colony to be colonized the very last is uh, Georgia when General Oglethorpe arrives in Georgia. If you grew up in Georgia, you would do Georgia history. But if you never grew up in Georgia, you probably never heard of General Oglethorpe or the fact that Georgia was the last of the 13 colonies to be colonized. And it was colonized here in the 17, early 1730s, 50 years after the 12th colony was colonized. Right? So, so we're talking a long period of time, and now there's a new group of, of going, and this is important because both White Whitfield and Wesley show up there as they go. Not a lot of, um, of inventions happening in this time frame. The Industrial Revolution doesn't really start until the end of the, you know, the end of the 1700s. But what is happening in this time frame is a lot of good thinkers. So Isaac Newton's done, uh, Dan Bernoulli, most of you probably don't know who he is, but he developed, he took uh, Newton's, uh, you know, Newton, Newton's equations and turned them into fluid dynamics and fluid mechanics, which allowed then for uh, the development overall over time of, uh, of, uh, of water systems, sewer systems, airplane wings, carburetors, all kinds of things that were developed as a result of some of some of his early thoughts and expanded on by others. You also had the beginning of, how many have heard the term the Enlightenment? Right, how many have heard the term uh, the modern era? Okay, how many have heard the term modernity? Okay, all those three terms are exactly the same. They mean the same thing. They are the Enlightenment, which is the age of reason, if you will. Because uh, prior, prior to the Enlightenment, that here we're at the we're coming to the end of the Renaissance period, the end of time where where people have time to deal with the arts and to deal with uh, with with people and and nice the niceties of life, but as we now move into the Industrial Revolution and the Enlightenment, science becomes the 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 ruling factor. And that doesn't really go into big swing until the 1800s. So here in the 1700s, we're still kind of, you know, the 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 best, uh, you know, the the houses with the best sewer systems just had a hole in the backyard. Otherwise, most towns, raw sewer still ran through the center of the street, and because stuff flows. <laughs> downhill, right? I mean, that's where that saying comes from, because that's how sewer systems worked. My, my daughter went to, uh, to in, in, in her senior year of high school, she went to uh, South Africa, and she went to the squatters camps to work in the squatters camps for the AIDS camps, and she came back and she said, Dad, you know, I tell you, you can see uh, poverty and just that kind of stuff on the videos, but you, you never understand it until you can smell it. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I thought that was very insightful for a... <laughs> for a anyways, so we have Wesley and uh, Whitfield. They're both British guys. Let's talk about each one. Uh, they, they're actually friends, even though one's Calvinist and one's Arminian. They both meet at Oxford. They're they both part of the same club at Oxford. Uh, uh, Whitfield gets, uh, gets saved around that time in his life, and he wants to dedicate his life to preaching the gospel and helping other people. So he decides to become a missionary, and he goes to, guess where? Georgia, right? Because the, at that point, the colony of Georgia was just established, so he goes to be a missionary to the Indians in Georgia, because that's the indigenous population. He's there for uh, two or three months, and in that time frame, he establishes an orphanage, and then he comes back to England. And for the rest of his life, the majority of his money and his income went to support this orphanage. Very altruistic guy, doing very good work. He, uh, he becomes a, uh, a traveling preacher because his methodologies were a little bit weird for most, uh, for most people at the time. He was part of the Anglican Church, which is the Church of England. 
which in America today is the Episcopal Church, has be, is what was the Church of England or the Anglican Church in America has become the Episcopal Church here. And, and he's part of that, uh, that world. And he's, uh, he's also a very, very strong Calvinist. And what he brings to the table realistically is that he's gonna prove Arminius wrong. If you remember Arminius, he made a statement about Calvinism. He said, you, Calvinism is the worst thing at all for preachers because it makes them slothful and lazy. Because if everybody, if God knows who's gonna be saved and who's not gonna be saved, what's it matter what the preacher does? He doesn't have to put a lot into it. Well, so, uh, so Whitfield, he proves Arminius wrong. He is the most prolific speaker and the most dynamic speaker ever in history to this day. And he says, uh, since we don't know who the elect are and who are the reprobate, we are to preach promiscuously. He uses really good words to, to <laughs> And he probably pronounces them with such grandeur that you just go, oh. <laughs> uh, we, we shall preach promiscuously to all, for the word may be useful even to the non-elect in restraining them from much wickedness and sin. So he, as a Calvinist, said, we can't preach to everybody. One, because God told us, and two, because it, we have to bring those to, who will be saved to salvation, and we can help influence the others just on the side. And that's a really, really good thing. As a young kid, he was, he was into theater and drama and acting, and he brought that theater and drama acting to his sermons, which is why they didn't really want him in the pulpit, in the church, because things were very... Stoics. Yes, you know, in the church at that time. In fact, all in the Anglican church, you, you actually read your sermon to the audience. You weren't allowed to be extemporaneous at that time. And so he was an extemporaneous guy. He would write out his sermons, but he would then talk for two to three hours extemporaneously to as many crowds that would show up to him in a field. And he would be dynamic and he would act out parts of the scripture. And he was he's, he's like the seeker sensitive guy today, you know, where it's all about production. And back then, you know, you didn't have any production. And if you're in if you're in colonial America, you're just trying to get by, you hear the Whitfields come into your town, you're gonna go see them. I mean, because one, it's free, although he makes you pay at the end. <laughs> In fact, there's some stories where he says, you know, guys went there to, to listen and made sure they didn't bring any money because they didn't want to. They didn't want to get talked into giving them their money. And by the time he was done, he was they were asking their friends for loans <laughs> so they could give, you know, so they could pay him because he's that good. He brings emotion and compassion and a real message of assurance that comes from knowing that God is sovereign and God is control and He wants you to be saved. He uses the uh, the the, the uh, um, Nicodemus term, "You must be born again," as his as his basic saying. But he uh, he uh, over, over his time frame, he goes to America seven different times, eighteen thousand sermons, ten million people. It's uh, oh, four minutes left. This is bad for me. Um, he, uh, uh, he he he's some historians say that that during his time, 90% of the population of colonial America had heard at least one, had been to at least one of his sermons. He was a big deal. And guess who his publicist was? His publicist was Ben Franklin. <laughs> right, so when Whitfield came back after to his second trip, he stopped in Philadelphia, made friends with Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin published all his sermons. Ben Franklin published his journals. Ben Franklin made a lot of money off Whitfield because Whitfield was the number one attraction in the United States during, well not the United States, in the colonial uh, America during, uh, for about a 20 year period of time. And he would travel horseback day after day after day, all the whole time, never stopping, one city after another, one town after another, one place after another, and most places that he stopped, more people came to his speeches than the population of the town that he was in. This is how many people came. And it said at one time that, uh, that his last sermon in Boston Commons before going back to London, there were 23,000 people there. No public address system, no electronics. On the pure command of his voice, people would just cringe. So that's Whitfield. And he didn't bring anything new to the table with the ex of Calvinism, except for the fact that you could still be a dedicated driver and, and evangelist under a Calvinistic system. 
Wesley, a friend of his, uh, uh, he was born uh, in, uh, in England, and he spent most of his life in England, even though we think about him in the American sense of the American church. He, um, he's actually spent most of his time in England. He went to Oxford, co-founded the Holy Club, which is uh, a group of students that were methodical about their personal holiness, right? And, this, uh, and later on in life, when he was being rammed by people who didn't like him, they, they, they made fun of him by calling him a Methodist, right? Because he was methodical about his, and he took that as a badge of honor and ended up, uh, even though he was part of the Church of England the whole, you know, his whole life, at the end of his life, he actually uh, uh, started to, de uh, to ordain Methodist deacons and preachers to come to America and preach to the new, the new you know, post-revolution uh, America, the United States, the United States of America, and that's how the Methodist Church started and was was formed. And it is a Wesleyan church, although it's both Wesley and Whitfield that should get credit for that because they were both they were both Methodist. Just one happened to be Arminian and one happened to be Calvinist, but they both the rest of their theology was the same. And so he, when he was 20, uh, 23, he said, hey, look, this is, this is good stuff. I want to dedicate my life to the Lord. Everything I want to do, I want to do for the Lord because I either sacrifice everything to the Lord or I'm giving it to the devil, one of the two. And, and he was just, he was into it. So then he goes off to, um, to America. He also follow, you know, he goes, actually goes to the colonies before Whitfield, but uh, he goes there for two, two years in order to be a preacher to the colonists there. Okay, and my, my time is up, but we, we got to finish this. Do what you got to do. All right, do what I, yeah. And so, uh, so, so he says, um, uh, and, and, and during his trip, so, so in the same way, remember all these guys that we talk about, they all, their, their theology is influenced by their experiences. He's on a wooden uh, ship coming to America in a major storm. The mast gets, or the, the mainsail gets ripped. People are yelling and screaming. Everybody thinks they're gonna die. And there's a handful of Moravian Christians, which are from Germany, who are known as being pacifists because of their dedication to the Lord, and they know that death is death, and when it happens, it happens, it doesn't really matter. So they're not gonna do anything to prolong their life. They will be, they, you know, they're just sitting there singing while everybody else on the ship is just, ah! right? Including, including Wesley. Well, see, so he asked these guys after they finally make it, uh, you know, make it and survive. He says, well, what's the deal? And then the guy looks at him, he says, well, do you know Jesus Christ is your savior? Because if you do, you, you wouldn't have these issues. And that just perplexed him because He's been a preacher. He was a preacher's kid. He was a good kid, and he wanted to dedicate himself to the Lord. He even made a club for how to be more methodical. And so, he, so when he went back to England, he talked to one of his Moravian guys, and they invited him to a, to a, uh, a service. And he says, uh, in the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Eldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. And about a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I remember Luther, his whole idea was to a, a faith that apprehends Christ, right? If you remember our discussion on Luther, he says, I felt my heart strangely warm. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine. So here's Wesley, who's been a preacher's kid, who's been a good Christian, who's dedicated his life to Christ, and when he's 33 years old, he gets saved. This is a big deal. This is his, um, what has become in the Arminian tradition or the Wesleyan tradition has kind of become known as the, uh, as the Holy Spirit baptism, right? At a point in your life where you really, really get it. And, uh, and, and, and this affects his theology, and he goes on to uh, work with and behind Whitfield. Whitfield gets these great revivals going in London and in Scotland, and then he goes back to America, and one time he asked Wesley to pick up his, uh, you know, his work in England, and Wesley does. But Wesley hates predestination, and he vehemently opposes it. But for both of them, they, uh, they make a big difference. 
what Wesley brings to the table is, is simply this, a new order of salvation. He would be Arminian, and he reads Arminius, and he understands, and he hates Calvinism with a passion, right? And he's going to do everything he can to destroy it, because even though he and Whitfield were on the same page from evangelism, they were not on the same page on salvation. But they still showed unity, because Whitfield actually asked Wesley to, to preach his uh, funeral. And that's a big, big deal. And he... And, and, and even though at times in their relationship it was estranged because of predestination, overall they showed unity to each other. So Wesley develops this process, and this one's important to walk through. Wesley says that God gives grace to certain people groups, and those people then have a choice to, to not necessarily accept it, but to not reject it. And that's an important point. That, uh, that you, you, it's, not, it's not that you accept it, it's that you choose not to reject it. And so he says, God gives provenient grace to everyone so that they can realize that they can't do it themselves, that they kind of need to change. And this was also Arminian. And then if you remember, Arminius also added some extra graces. Well, Wesley's going to define them, and he's going to take them to the next level. And he says, if you get to this point where you realize you can't do things yourself, that's a realization that you need to change, and you would be one who would be truly repentant, but not necessarily know how to, to do it. So you could become Buddhist, you could become Islam, you could become New Age pantheist, or any of the worldviews that, that John's talking about in, in the sermon. But you realize you can't do it, you have to get something else to help you out. Well, so at that point, God says, I'm going to give you now convincing grace if you're the truly repentant. And what that convincing grace allows you to do is to know that Jesus is the answer, that Jesus did it all. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And the resulting of that is you say, well, you know, oh, then I must change. It's not just I need to change. I must change. And Jesus is the answer. So you go from, go from realizing you can't do it to realizing that Jesus did it. And now you actually have repentance in your life, whether it's just mentally or by action. He, Wesley would like both, but he's okay with just mental. And now you're part of a group of people that are convicted to believe, but haven't yet believed, right? But you're convicted. You know you can't do it, and Jesus is the only way. So God then gives you justifying grace. And at this point, it is God that justifies you. This one's in green. It's, no, it's not a people's choice. This is God justifying you. This is how he becomes more Calvinistic in that uh, your faith is God's, even though you had pieces and parts to play prior. But God justifies you through your faith, and then God changed you. So I need to change. I must change. God changed me. This is a big deal. Now you are regenerated, and you have new birth. You are born again. And if you're born again, God's going to give you sanctifying grace. And that sanctifying grace then allows you to do good work so that you see the changes that are made. If you see the changes, you're now assured or reassured that what God says is true. And now you're not just a uh, born again, you're now a child of God because you're assured of the child of God. And so God gives you more sanctifying grace that allows you to do more good works so that you have more assurance of the change. And that's how uh, Wesleyan Arminianism plays itself out. And it's based to some extent on his experience and his hatred toward Calvinism and his acceptance of grace as a commodity and takes that idea of grace as a commodity to a very far limit, so coming up with five different types of grace, because the fifth one would be, um, would be glorifying grace at the end. And, 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 it, and, it's, and it becomes the basis now for most Arminian and Wesleyan uh, type of churches today, or at least a variation of this scheme. And so that's, uh, that's what I said. And I needed to hit that before we could go on. So, uh, but, but you see how some of these ideas come about. The, the big issue with that is none of those terms for the different types of graces is actually in the Bible, right? But that doesn't mean it's not a reasonable way to understand the how behind the Bible when the Bible only gives you the what. 
And most theologians, tr theologians try to do that. The Bible tells you what God does, but he doesn't tell you how God does it, it to a great amount of detail. And theologians try to get that level of detail. Well, these guys were showed unity together, except over predestination. These guys, their, both their experiences influenced their theology. And Wesley, though, he expanded Augustine's idea of grace as a commodity into these multiple types of grace because, um, it, but he didn't hold to Augustine's idea that faith itself was a grace. He was Arminian in that perspective. All right, so that takes us to where are we going to get to at the end? All right. If we only get through this chart, we will do fine, but I hope to get through more than this because there's a lot of good, there's a lot of good stuff here. For me, I, so I'm going to reflect to you what I learned from this study in doing all the, the reading. Really, four questions I, I ended up realizing were actual questions that I needed to answer. The first one is just to ask yourself, is your view of salvation influenced by your own experience? And, and I think you kind of have to that have to answer that question yes and it was very clear in this study that whether you were Pelagius or Augustine or Luther or Erasmus or Whitfield or Wesley or any of these guys their experience is reflected in their theology of salvation that's a very interesting thing, because a lot of times we take theologies as, oh, that's gotta be, that one's gotta be right, not thinking that sometimes we think it's right because it meets our own experience, as opposed to say, well, if somebody else's experience may, may look at it a little different. Second question, can you do anything to save yourself from death without God's intervention? And, and I would hope that if you had done this amount of study that your answer would be no, you can't. This is, the big, this is probably my biggest takeaway from this whole study. And so to be kind of transparent and, and, and honest, um, when I do my Bible study, I, it's hard for me to not walk away with the idea of total depravity. Right? I, I gave you a whole list of scripture verses that do it. But I've been taught all my life that if I believed in total depravity, I had to be a Calvinist. You to be what? A Calvinist. Oh. That it is the Calvinist perspective that believes in total depravity, and the, all the other perspectives believe in some partial depravity. And, and I'm just telling you that's what I think I've been taught all my life. Maybe you have too or, or not, or that has been, you know, because I grew up, uh, you know, I grew up in congregational churches as a kid, but I never heard the gospel. I don't even remember any of that except the girls. Um, <laughs> but once I got saved, I've always been in either Baptist churches or Bible churches. And, uh, and they tend to be, they tend to lean, you know, Calvinistic. And, but what I learned from this study is, with the exception of Pelagius, all these guys were total depravity guys. Which tells you that you can, that, that it, maybe it's possible that God can get your attention in multiple ways to overcome your depravity. Not just one which is that God has to give you your faith, which is that, that more Calvinist view. Not that that couldn't be true, but it may not be the only way to look at it. And so that leads to the last two questions you, that you have to struggle with, is what is faith? Is it a work? Is it a merit? Or is it something different? And then you have to ask the question for yourself, how about your faith? Is it actually yours? Is it purely self-determined? Or was it given to you by an external source? I mean, these are really good questions to contemplate. And I would contend, I can't give you that answer 
that's these are answers you have to get by yourself. But I will contend. I'm gonna. This is gonna be fun. We may not be able to do any of the questions, and I apologize. So we'll try to do one. But here's an interesting question for you. Do you believe that you develop your theology based upon your reading of scripture? Or do you think that you interpret your scripture based upon your theology? Really yeah, and, and, and so to, to kind of follow this along with what John is, is teaching in this ser sermon series, most of us interpret what we read based upon our worldview, even if we don't know what our worldview is. Right? And if we do know, we still interpret it based upon that. It would be nice for us to say, oh no, I'm so open that I can read scripture in a way that the scripture will mold me to, and, and not that that doesn't happen, that does happen over time, right? It does happen over time. But let me, what's the, what's the very most common verse people use to, uh, to prove that, uh, that your salvation is by grace through faith and it's not of works? Right. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. I love this verse, right? Everybody uses it. I've used it a thousand times, you know? And, and, but here's the interesting question. This, 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 is, this is a great part. So the word that and the word it, these are pronouns. And you have this nice statement that says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. So there's your statement. There's your opening statement. That is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one might boast. What's the gift? Is it talking about grace or faith? Well, it, 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 it yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> or both. You, well, you have to look at, <laughs> or save. It's the that. That is the gift. That is a pronoun. Now, the it is a pronoun too, but it's not in the original language. That's why it's uh, italicized. So you have to go back to this that. That that, which has to be something in that clause before, that is a gift of, well, what is that? Well, that's a pronoun, so it has to be a noun. So the, 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 there's one noun is you, but that's more the subject. I mean, the, uh, the, but faith is a noun. And so if you're a good Calvinist, you're going to say, well, look, faith is the last noun in that uh, particular clause. And we know that faith naturally and normally is a work, but Paul says it's not a work. So therefore, faith has to be given to you by God. This is faith of salvation. Not all faith. This is just faith for salvation. So a good Calvinist says that faith is the gift. Don't you see it? It's as clear as day that faith is the gift. Right? Now, if you're, if you're Arminian, then you're going to look up here and you say, oh no, this whole little section is about grace. And we have five different types of grace. <laughs> so the grace must be the gift. Right? There, there's no reason why grace isn't the gift. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Grace has to be the gift. And grace is what saves you. Aren't we saved by grace? And you should all say amen. amen. Right? Well, and so you, you go, okay. Well, you, you can't both use the same verse. To, to, you know, and so there's another way to look at it, though, because pronouns don't have pronouns relate to the antecedent. If you remember your uh, grammar, uh, I had to look that one up. Uh, <laughs> and so what you what you can do is you can say, okay, well, what is this? What is this clause about? Well, the verb saved. Well, the the uh, the pronoun can't be for a verb. But the verb is saved. So what, what's that whole sentence about? If you could summarize that sentence in one word, what would it be? It's a concept. Salvation. Is salvation a noun? Yes. Right. So you could say that salvation is the gift. Well, and that would also make sense when you have, uh, uh, like, Romans um, uh, 6.23. You all know that. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, right? Is salvation. But the fun part about this little study is, is, is this. You can get any Greek scholar to be on your side if they're on your side. You can interpret scripture based upon your theology if you want. And it's okay. Paul's not always known to be the best grammarist. He doesn't always write clearly. 
and uh, and you could argue well you know this is neuter and these two are feminine and so therefore you can't ever use either one of them but you don't know whether Paul was that good at grammar or not right and uh, but as you look at it the, the the takeaway is this it doesn't matter I think which one but if you if a verse can be used to to support every everybody's uh, theology then you just can't use it anymore <laughs> to support a theology. Right, you can't use it to support a theology. You have to find other verses now that support, and now all of a sudden it becomes much, much harder. So I had asked you this question earlier, what is necessary for salvation? And this was your answer. You said that human faith and the Holy Spirit's calling is, uh, is it. But after finishing the study, I think I misled this question because I forced you to think through human faith versus God and the like. And, and, and so I'm, I'm going to reword this, this particular one, and you should be able to, uh, once it starts to, once it goes, there we go, should be able to vote now. So here's the question. What is necessary for salvation? When I say salvation, I mean justification here, the, your initial uh, belief. Is it 100% human faith, although influenced by God? Is it 100% God-given faith? Is it kind of a 50-50 thing? You know, God has a play, you have a play. Is it, um, you know, eh, mostly God and a little bit of you? You know, the 80-20 rule, however you want to use that. Or is it 100% both? And maybe none of those answers are, are good for you, and that's okay too. But if you had to pick one, which one would you pick? Ah, so you guys have actually been listening. This is really, really good. And, and there's, a, there's a good reason for that. If, if you think about the history of church doctrine, it start, you know, the first big issue was, uh, 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 was, was about whether uh, God was, whether, whether there's a trinity or not. You know, is God one or is God three? And the answer was not either or. The answer became both, 100% both. The next big issue was whether Christ was man or Christ was God, right? And, 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 and it was an either-or debate. Well, what was the answer? Yes. Both, 100% both. That's the only way you could. And then the next big issue was salvation. Was it either of God or either of man? And we're still debating it as an either-or issue. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's a both-and issue, too. So, yeah, that's really good, huh? All right, we're going to do this last one that was, uh, what's your theological bent? And we did this one before, so I'll be able to show you what, you what you did. The difference in this one and the last one is F used to be open theist, but nobody answered that, which means nobody knew what it was. So it doesn't, so I just replaced that with I'm neither. And G used to be I don't know, and G is now I still don't know. So this class really didn't do me any good. Uh, and C is the big, woo, more people are leading Arminian. Now, honestly, I, I, that's what I would have thought, because we're going to compare this now to what your answers were at the beginning. All right, look at the big delta here, and look at the big delta here. So it's good that you actually thought through some of this, and you're starting to get a perspective. It's interesting that here are the Eileen Calvinists, is died, and I apologize for that in the class. That was not my intent, albeit uh, maybe some of my own bias came out, and I would apologize for that because I'm not anti-Calvinist. I just wouldn't be a Calvinist, and so I, if that happened, that's that's bad on me. I'm not Arminian either, and I wouldn't be Arminian. But um, we got some more Arminians, and. And I would contend for, most, for the reason why, when I was watching your faces and getting the uh, feedback from, from faces, I think the, the, the turning point for many of you was when you realized that the basis of Calvinism is that uh, the faith is not yours, that you don't have any say. God chooses who's saved and who goes to hell, and that's all there is to it. Thank you very much. You can leave now, right? And, 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 and I could see in many of you, you went, what? Because it doesn't seem to reflect reality. 
That doesn't mean it's not true, right? But I think it becomes a contention point with many, and I you can see that in your answers. Wow, so that's that's pretty F good. Went from zero to. Yeah, but F was uh, the the open theist. So the the neither is good. That's that's probably a good answer. Also, I want to spend a couple of minutes, if you don't mind, doing a couple of summaries and explaining a couple of charts in here. So this is my one of my big takeaways. Is we had used this this kind of a chart that that kind of grace versus human choice as a mechanism, and and even though I still think it's good to frame the argument, in, in the end I don't think it's the right way to understand the argument. But it did help me to understand one thing. It helped me to understand how you can believe in total depravity and not be only on this end that says God gives you the faith. That God can provide you truth, if you will, in multiple ways. He can either give it to you, the Holy Spirit can convict you, sometimes that is resistible, sometimes not resistible. Some people go, huh, I couldn't say no, you know, when the Holy Spirit pulled me or whatever it is. Sometimes you can take provenient grace if you think that grace is, is given out and that you got some of it and, and that helps you. This helps you to overcome your depravity or just God's direct revelation. Some of this comes from the fact that many of you in here have said that you've been a Christian all your life, that you don't know a time when you weren't, that you've always known that God loves you and you've always loved God from as long as you can remember. Well, that probably comes from the fact that either your parents or a pastor or the Bible or somebody gave you God's direct revelation and you believed it all your life. You didn't have any of these other experiences. But you got God's truth, and God's truth changed your perspective. You didn't push back on it like most people do. So you can still be totally depraved, but, God, but you were an easy target for God. If you want to think about it that way. So the farther you go over here, the more God has to hit you over the head with a two by four in order to get your attention, right? But, uh, but that was my big takeaway, that you can believe in total depravity and not have to be over here. It's okay to be over here, but you don't have to be over here. And that was a big deal for me because I, biblically, total depravity seemed like the only answer from the Bible, from the, just the overall scripture to, you know, to me, and I gave you all those verses. But there seem to be the idea that, that the idea that always gnawed at me was the idea that grace is a commodity, and if a grace is given to you, you can't say no to that. That kind of makes sense. But if grace is just truth, truth can be provided to you in many different ways. And what we try to do in faith, what we do in faith is we either accept truths or we don't reject them is a better way to, to talk about it. We don't reject truth. Many times we do reject truth, but when we get to the point where we can't reject the truth, then it becomes our belief. We didn't believe it. We just didn't, we got to that point where we didn't reject it. And so, uh, you know, so what I don't like about this is the Calvinist Arminian view. I would propose this view and then we'll, we'll close. And you don't have to believe this or not believe it, but this is what, this is, after this whole study, this is where, where I end up falling. And, and again, I, I'm, the whole study, I tried not to put my own perspective in here, but my perspective did change over time. I would contend that instead of uh, that triangle of God's sovereignty versus human free will, what's better to measure is what system gives the most glory to God? Now, sometimes a, a, a good Calvinist church would say that too, that you should always err on the side of giving more glory, which means you should believe in my position. Because by definition, my position gives more glory or I wouldn't have it. But the more I think through the different positions, I think both of them have a serious flaw in that as you move them off to the extreme, as you start taking those positions away from just the idea of salvation and move them into the realm of all of life, they both take glory away from God. And I would explain it uh, kind of this way. And I, 
I was really hit by Luther's idea of a faith that apprehends Christ. Luther didn't want, you know, he, he didn't know how to explain it that well, but he, I thought he did a really good job in saying your faith apprehends Christ, that Christ is all-consuming. All about salvation is Christ. It's in Christ. It is Christ. And, and when your faith apprehends Christ, that's, that's it. And at that point, you get the Holy Spirit you, uh, you, and the regeneration and all that stuff happens. And, and, and he, he defined it that way. Uh, even though in the end, because he was fighting against the semi-Pelagians in the Catholic Church, he ended up becoming a hard determinist. So he was fighting against these, so he became way over here. But I think in his initial thoughts that he was trying to find that, that balance. But if you were to say that God chose to give you faith, that your faith comes from God, then you'll start down this slippery slope. You could try really hard to stay up here, and that's good, and it's a wonderful thing. A lot of a lot of good Calvinists are compatibilists, which be, they, they believe that you do have free will, but that God set things up that he would know exactly what your response would be, and so he really did choose you for salvation. Or you can come all the way down to the end and says there, there, there's nothing, just God did everything. I'm a, we're just you know we're just puppets. But there's a variation as you move up here. The hard part is. It, it, is a, it is a slippery slope, and you have to work to stay near the, near the top. You have to, because if you think about it, the more that God controls everybody's destiny, either, even specifically to either heaven or hell, takes true love and worship away from the human. Well, what glorifies God? Our, our true love and worship of him gives him more glory. The farther you move down here, the more you take love, true love, because true love requires you to say no. Right? Love requires you to be able to reject. Otherwise, it's not really love, and you start to take glory away from God. Molina had a good thought. He said, hey, look. God's bigger than that. He can handle the free will things. On the other hand, if you believe that it was you that believed, then as you, it becomes real easy to say, well, then what else can I do? Ah, what else do I need to do? Oh, without God. Without God. And, 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 and as you start sliding down this side of the, of the slope, it takes glory away from God, period, because it gives the glory to you. Now, you could try real hard to stand right up there, but I think in reality, I'm not even fair in this. The picture should be more like that. That when you start down one side or the other, it's a steep slope that's really, really hard to not, you know, you're always fighting against uh, the, the desire to move to the end. And I'm also not saying that either one of these is wrong, it, 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 but I'm also not saying either one of them is right. These are really good, smart people who developed really good theologies to try to explain the next level down of how God does things, typically based upon their own experience and their own reading of scriptures, and they did, a, I think, a really good job. They all had really good points. But they all went maybe a little too far. And so maybe, here's, here's what I just ended up thinking, taking some of the goodness from both, all of them. Because the one nice thing is when you, when you try to understand why they understand, why they believe what they believe, you're not always trying to figure out what's stupid about that. You're trying to figure out what's good, right? What's the good things? And so if you take some of the good things, I, I would look at it this way. Instead of saying that God chose to give you faith, which comes from the idea of grace as a commodity and the like, I would say that God provides truth to us in many different ways. God provides us truth. And it is truth. He provides it through scripture. He provides it through others. He provides us through our experience. He provides us through the Holy Spirit. He provides us through maybe even provenient grace or some types of grace, whatever it is. Don't, don't call it grace, call it truth. He provides, that's the gift, right? 
Versus, instead of saying you believed, you got to say, I got to the point where I could no longer reject it. And there's a nuanced difference between those two. Because the fact that you can't reject it is humility. You're saying, it's not about me. It's about something else. I can't say no to that. It's a humility piece, which is what I think Luther was trying to get to, but he didn't articulate it in the way that it just jumps out. Uh, and so, now that doesn't mean it's easy to stay on the tip. Right? It's hard to stay on the balance. It's easy to fall one side or the other. And what we tend to do in our society is we've had two halves of our church fall to one side or the other. And they get so vehement against the other side that we, we, we provide splits within the church when in reality isn't this supposed to provide unity because we all believe in Jesus. The how may be a little bit odd, but it's, can I live with my brother who says it's their faith and they got to do a little more works? Or do I hate him because it's just all about Jesus? Or can I live with my brother that says, I don't have to do anything because God already chose me? You know, you know that's how we see each other, and yet to each other, I mean, to ourselves, we go, "Oh no, this is the only thing that makes sense." I've read all of Scripture; it makes sense this way. Well, the other guy says exactly the same thing. I've read all the Scripture, and it makes sense to me this way. So, how do you how do you do that? The last thing I'm going to leave you with, and I'm not going to go through it because we are out of time, is on the back of your page. I gave you two charts that kind of look like this. What I tried to do as I went through this study, because the, remember the title of it is, I could be wrong, right? I mean, we could be wrong on any of this, and these guys could be right. They also could be wrong. They can't both be right, but maybe parts of them could be right. They can't, but they could both be wrong, or maybe parts of them are just wrong. So what I tried to do is I went through their thought process and I said, what's reasonable? What, what is scripturally reasonable? from their perspective. What is scripturally possible from their perspective? And what is scripturally eh, not really definitive? Where it truly is a theological extension of scripture, not scripture itself. And they all have them, we all have them. This is why John's talking about worldviews, because he wants us to start to expunge these kind of things that get in our way and focus more on these kind of things. And so for a guest guy, you know, and I'll just do a couple of these, that I think total, his ideas of total depravity were really, really good. But he may have gone a little bit too far in defining spiritual death, because it's not really a scriptural thing. There's a couple of verses in there that help you with it. And then I think he, he may have been wrong when he said that faith is given to you by God because I gave you a, a whole page of faith and works scriptures. And I challenge you to find one or more than one. You need to find more than one. You don't get to just find one. Uh, that would indicate that the faith is not yours, that you don't have a play in, in your faith and, and, and free will. And it's very difficult. He also said salvation is by grace and not merit. I think that's very scripturally supported. But then he came out and said, well, the grace is a commodity. And you can get there from scripture, but you don't have to. And then he, but then he went farther and said that human faith is a merit. It's a work. And I'm not sure that's a good definition of faith. You can't get that from scripture. Same with Luther. And by the way, you need it. I changed this last night as I was thinking through this again. Uh, but Luther says justification by faith. I think that's reasonable. He says it's a faith that apprehends Christ. He was really struggling with that, and I think it's a, a, it, it's it, it, it's a possible idea. But then at the end, he goes, "Well, there's God's secret will, and we just don't want to talk about it." I just I know what it is, but y'all shouldn't talk about it. And that secret will is that He chose you for salvation, and He chose you to go to hell, right? And that's what he he ended up with at the end. But he he didn't like talking about it, so he called it his secret. Well, so you might want to change that one on your charts because I, I changed that. Same with Calvin, Arminius, and Wesley. Calvin, uh, his possible truth is double predestination. 
But he could be wrong in his idea of foreknowledge and foreordination. Same with Arminius. He could be wrong in his idea of foreknowledge and foreordination. Those are they're not biblical in a sense. They're philosophical that are derived maybe from biblical, but not really biblical. Um, whether there's preventing grace to all, it's not. You, know, you, you, you can pull that out of scripture, but the, the word's not used. Right? And then same with Wesley. Wesley has some great ideas on the fact that love requires free choice and that and, and believers need a new birth. But the interesting thing here is that believers need a new birth. Not the unsaved. But believers need a new birth. And, and, but because remember, that's his experience. And I think he's got way too many graces <laughs> that you just can't prove from Scripture. It's possible. So for all of these guys, they have some really good basis. And then they expand on it. And then they peel that onion back to explain how. And their hows may or may not be right. They could be. And so if you take some lessons away, you get this. God can help our total depravity by providing us truth in various ways, not just one. There's not just one way God can provide you the truth. But our theology is based upon our experience. Only God justifies. If you don't take this away, you're, you're really in trouble. Right? Only God justifies. Only God glorifies. Now, we've been talking about sanctification here because this was a, a class on salvation, on justification. But uh, don't judge other people's justification because it doesn't meet your expectation of your experience. Only God gets to do that. Love requires the ability to reject or resist or to not love. And salvation theology should always try to maximize glory to God. Whatever you come up with, whatever you feel is going on, and, and this is not a postmodern thing. Oh, it feels good. It, 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 be scriptural. Be scriptural, and try to be uh, try not to allow theologies given to you to interpret that scripture, because uh, you know if you get too much to the God determinism side, it takes away the creature's love, and that doesn't give God the glory. If you're too much on the human responsibility side, it takes away God's glory, period, right? Because you're glorifying yourself. And also remember that every student takes their teacher's stuff to the extreme. And that's what happened in every single one of these debates all along through history. And that's why we're still debating it today. Heavenly Father, sorry to go so long. And I ask that you would bless the time that we spend. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.